Hi, I'm Debbie Dillon and today we're going to be talking about health promotion and maintenance. In this unit we're going to be looking at issues surrounding growth and development, pregnancy and the childbirthing process, newborn care, reproductive issues, and end this unit a three-part tape with health assessment. Let's begin by looking at growth and development. What are some of the factors that may influence growth and development? What do we need to know on the NCLEX to correctly answer these questions? We're going to be looking at stages of play, Erickson's developmental tasks, normal outcomes or behaviors for each age group, sequences of addition of solid food items, and appropriate toys for each age group. We must remember that factors that also influence growth and development include the environment, the genetic development, health and that environment in which we live, as well as family relationships. Let's look first at the stages of play development. The first stage, with the zero to one year old, they begin by holding toys, exploring. Remember, most things go to their mouth. One to seven year olds begin to look at imitation. They want to wear the cap in the hospital like the surgeon will wear. They want to wear their father's tool belt when at home. The little girl carries around or the boy carries around the baby. Eight to 12 year olds are into games and hobbies. They begin to um, play in competitive sports and organized activities, taking on early leadership roles. Infancy, children are usually involved in what's called solitary play. This is where they play alone. When we move into the toddler period, we're looking at parallel play, which is where we play maybe with the same pile of blocks, but instead of building together, we build pyramids that are next to each other. As we advance into preschool, we're looking at associative play. Here we follow the leader. Children will take on a leadership role with others following along behind. And as we develop into preschool years, here we develop more cooperative learning. Cooperative play would be such things as playing baseball, soccer, and getting involved in maybe a gymnastics team. Now what type of screening test can be used in order to decide how a child is developing? The Denver Developmental Screening Test is the primary test used from birth to six years. And what you're looking at with the Denver Developmental Screening Tool is personal and social development, fine motor skills, language development, as well as gross motor skills. When institutions bring in the Stanford Binet test, we are looking here at the mental development of an individual. IQ or intelligent quotient would be another type of assessment tool. Here we look at mental age times 100 divided by the chronological age. Here we're looking at judgment, comprehension, and reasoning. Now what types of things can we use to evaluate developmental tasks? What skills should we be seeing happen as a child develops? Erickson is the primary tool used for developmental evaluation. Freud would have looked at psychosocial and Piaget at cognitive development. These are not usually tested on the NCLEX, but you must have an adequate understanding of Erickson's developmental tasks. Let's begin with birth. As we look at the birthing process, 18 months um, from birth to 18 months of infancy, a child is developing in the areas of trust versus mistrust. Can they be sure that when they cry, someone is going to pick them up, that someone is going to feed them and keep them comfortable? Positive results would, from this development would be the development of trust in themselves and others. Negative development would be shown in a child who is withdrawn and isolated, oftentimes what we would see in a child that is autistic. As we go further into development, we, be, we begin to look at the 18-month to 3-year-old or toddler stage. Here the toddler is developing in the areas of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Positive developmental skills would include exercise of self-control. And we know that one of the hallmark developmental skills during the toddler period is getting them through those terrible twos. A child that would remain in the negative developmental stages would remain defiant and negative or ha continuing to have temper tantrums. As we look a little further into development, we get into the issues of preschoolers. The three to six-year-old preschool child is looking at initiative versus guilt. 
And here, a positive development would be represented in their ability to learn limits. They know that they cannot cross the street without holding someone's hand, that you don't take candy out of the grocery store without having paid for it. Negative behaviors would be presented in such um, observations as fearfulness or per Per pessimistic behavior. Pessimistic behavior would be children that cannot find something happy in what's going on around them. School type behaviors are starting to develop during this time period as well as the adjustment to going to school full time. As we look at the school age child, the 6 to 12 year old, we're looking at developmental tasks of industry versus inferiority. Positive identifiers in this category would include the sense of confidence they can achieve. Children towards the end of this age group begin to take CPR courses, learn to get training in being helpful with different types of activities such as babysitting or yard work. Negative behaviors, on the other hand, would be represented in a child who had self-doubt and felt inadequate in competing in sporting activities or group type issues. Now, as we advance into the older child, we start to see behaviors that maybe we can recognize. One warning I would like to give you at this time is going into the Sylvan Center to take your NCLEX. Do not take personal experiences in with you. You must answer these test questions based on Erickson's developmental tasks, not on what your own children, yourself, or other people and family members you've been around have done. Now let's continue to look at the adolescent. As we look at the adolescent, we're looking at someone between the ages of 12 to 20 years of age. Here they are looking at identity versus role diffusion. Are they able, in a positive outcome, to comprehend a sense of themselves in the environment? Can they stand their ground? Can they resist peer pressure? Those that develop negative type characteristics will have a lack of identity and follow a crowd. They will become involved in alcohol, sex, and drug abuse. Negative behavior needs to be avoided. As we advance from adolescence into young adulthood, we are looking at the 20 to 45 year old adult. Here they are looking at intimacy versus isolation. Positive behaviors are the development of intimate relationships. Marriage takes place, childbirth usually occurs within some couples, and career and family responsibilities start to become paramount. Those that are unable to accomplish these positive achievements in a negative framework will avoid issues of intimacy or areas of responsibility around the career, family, or even monetary values. As we advance into adulthood, we get into issues where the people are aging. Here we have people in the age group of 45 to 65 years of age or middle adulthood. They are dealing with the developmental task of generativity versus stagnation. Positive outcomes in this developmental stage would include creativity and productivity. Are they able to transition from the middle years into the years of golden years, such as looking at retirement, whether or not they have been successful in their life, and whether their finances can take them into their later years? Negative developmental characteristics during this stage would be looking at an individual who remains self-centered, is not able to reach out to their community or family, and becomes self-focused. As we look at late adulthood, we're looking at the individual who is greater than 65 years of age. Here they are looking at integrity versus despair. Positive outcomes come from the individual who has been able to look back across their lifespan and see meaningful development and accomplishments personally and professionally. Negative adjustments would be those individuals that lack any meaning in the years that have preceded. They remain isolated and find themselves frequently alone during this period. Illnesses can occur because of this loneliness as well as maladaptation. Let's continue to look at some other issues surrounding growth and development. We need to remember that growth is more rapid in utero and during infancy and adolescence. It's cyclic. Developmental issues come into play here and nursing interventions need to be adjusted during the time periods of rapid growth to enhance continued development and meet increased needs such as nutrition. Developmental tasks include skills and competencies associated with each developmental stage. As well as developmental milestones become the standard of reference to compare a child's behavior. Is this child actually developing in the areas that we expect them to at the rate that they should be? 
developmental delays would be any lags that are identified in the range given for that behavior. Now here again, you have to remember that we need to foster the family's understanding of these developmental tasks. Individuals that compare Joey to Sandra next door are going to run into difficulties. Sandra may have been able to walk at an earlier age at the lower end of the de developmental task framework, whereas Joey is a little bit later, both within the normal range. Parenting skills also need to be evaluated. Is the parent able to establish a strong family network? Is there a relationship developing with issues of control? Is there a routine in the house? Is it a safe environment and does it include socialization? Is the child recognized and listened to? Now let's go back and start to look at how the infant grows and develops throughout the lifespan. The first thing we're going to look at is the small child. And remember that the developmental task for an infant from the ages of 1 to 18 months is trust versus mistrust. A one-month-old, as they develop, has head sag, and as we pr approach into the two-month period, with closing of the posterior fontanelles, the child begins to be able to turn from side to back and will smile socially. He actually can begin to hold his head upright. Safety issues come into play here, and the children can roll off the bed because they are unsupervised and mom didn't expect this new behavior. Appropriate toys for this age group include mobiles that are black and white with contracting colors and frequently see these as birds or toy items and also a wind-up infant swing. Noises should be eliminated and children usually at this stage are afraid of strangers. They oftentimes begin to smile and this is nice reinforcement to the family and it's not usually just because of that little gas bubble. Now let's go a little bit further and look at a three-month-old child. The three-month-old child will bring objects to their mouth and can now appropriately hold their head erect. They no longer look like that bobbing doll on the back of the car window. They smile and they may actually begin to laugh during this stage. As they progress into the four-month period, their thumb begins to take on a coordinated action so that they're in a position of being able to start to try and grasp at things around them. They also begin to drool, sometimes the first sign of teething. The tonic neck reflex is absent at this time. The moral reflex is also being eliminated. Some of the appropriate toys for this time period are rattles, because they do have this ability to grasp because of the thumb, the cradle gym, which is something they would lay underneath of and have toys above them to be able to grasp and play with, the wind chime, because it's a pleasant sound off in the distance and is a good way to evaluate hearing, as well as stuffed animals. They're warm and cuddly. Again, safety becomes an issue. For example, stuffed animals with eyes that can be pulled off or noses that can be bit at would be dangerous and the child could aspirate on these small items. Stuffed animals and toys that the child plays with should not have pieces that could fit in the mouth or lodge in the throat. Now let's go further and look at the five-month-old child. One of the hallmark signs of a five-month-old child is that the birth weight doubles. NCLEX likes to ask you this. They would like you to be able to realize whether or not this child is developing well nutritionally or whether they have problems with failure to thrive. Six-month-olds begin teething formally. They can turn from their back to their stomach. And at this point, they also will begin to try and sit upright but cannot remain there without support. Appropriate toys for a child during this time period include brightly colored um, toys small enough to grasp, but again, remember, not large and large enough for safety. We don't want these pieces in their mouth. Unbreakable mirrors. The child begins to recognize themselves in, in the windows that we go past with reflections and the mirrors in the house. Giving them their own mirror also helps with self-identity. Weight and suction toys are also fun, and I think they're also easier for parents in that we don't find them on the floor quite as often. Teething toys that can be refrigerated but will not burst in the child's mouth would also help with pain control during this teething period. Now we're going to move and look at the seven and eight month old child. What are the hallmarks here? With a seven month old child, we begin to look at a child who's able to sit for short periods of time, but their fear of strangers has increased. This is a child who is propped in an infant seat and reaches for the mother each time she leaves the room, even though she has not left the house. An eighth-month-old continues with this fear of strangers, and actually it has increased. 
Luckily, at this age, these children cannot run after us, or we would never even be able to take a chance to go into the bathroom for a shower. Remember that children during these ages need to be supervised. They should not be left alone unless in, in their crib or in a safe environment. Now, what types of toys can we use for a seven to eight month old child? Appropriate toys for this age group are toys, again, that are large enough and bright colored, that have movable parts because at this point the child tries to roll them on the floor. They're a little more mobile. At this time, they like things that make noise. It attracts their attention. And they begin to find enjoyment in things like colored blocks and the jack-in-the-box. But hopefully the jack-in-the-box has a funny face, or at least friendly. When we continue in through the infant developmental task period, we begin to look at the issues surrounding the 9- and 10-month-old child. The 9-month-old child can elevate themselves to a sitting position. This does not mean that the child is going to stay in this position, so they need to be in an area where they are not going to flop over and hit their head on some objects that would be dangerous. A nine-month-old child also begins to say dada, and of course this enlightens the family because the child is finally speaking something that can be understood. The ten-month-old child should be crawling. Now here again I'm going to warn you, many of you know children that have crawled at six and seven months. Remember that the developmental task norm is 10 months crawling well. At this point in time they can also pull themselves to a standing position. Again, you should be concerned here with safety. A child that can pull themselves to a standing position can get those items on your coffee table, whether it be a cigarette that could be smoldering in an ashtray or in some piece of small device that they could choke on. Check your environment. Children during this time period also begin to vocalize more words and hopefully begin to say mama as well. As we move into the 11-month-old period, the child is able at this time to stand in with an erect posture with support. Again, I have not said that the child would normally be walking. We all know children that can walk in an 18-month, an 8- to 9-month period. But here the norm is for a child to stand erect and hold themselves comfortably at 11 months, not ambulate. At 12 months, we see a child whose weight has tripled. Again, if we were looking at issues of failure to thrive, this would be a key area to identify a child whose birth weight had not increased. Children during this stage of 12-month period enjoy eating with their fingers, if you could stretch it to this time period. Children, as they develop, have eaten dinner at the dinner table. They open their mouth and attempt to try and eat with the family. They need to be given here bite-sized foods that are soft, but not items that will choke. Food items that should be avoided during this period include popcorn, macaroni would be another choice that would be better, peanuts, which a child should not be eating until they're considerably older, and a hot dog. We do not give a child a full-length hot dog to gnaw on. They can bite off large pieces and it will lodge in their throat. We also should not cut up that hot dog for them to put into their mouth. It's too easy for it to lodge and too easy for them not to chew it completely. Softer items, again, like macaroni or biscuits would be better for them to be chewing on. Now, what types of toys can we give a child who's 11 to 12 months in age? Toys that are appropriate for this age group include books. These are large picture books, usually laminated because they will chew them, and fairly thick in nature. They also, at this point in time, because they are erect, like to push and pull toys. They can get up on their knees and scoot these items across the, the den or kitchen floor. Teddy bears are a toy that children enjoy. It has a face, it can look back, and they're snuggly. A large ball is fun. We can teach them coordination on what give and take is. We roll the ball to them, and they push it back. Sponge toys in the bathtub are fun because they can compress them, as well as cups and spoons. We've all seen the 11 to 12 month old that gnawing at us and nagging during dinner hour or the arsenic hour looking for attention. By finding toys in the kitchen for the child to play with, we can in turn help them contain themselves or entertain themselves while we're cooking dinner. Giving them a pot and a pan or a wooden spoon to play with gives them something different that they have not been playing with during the day. Now let's go on and look at some other issues surrounding the infant. Let's here talk about the introduction of solid foods. I've alluded to some of the problems with food items, but let's walk through this again. As we look at cereal, children are usually started on cereal as one of the first food items. Rice cereal is usually the first cereal of choice. Milk, especially whole milk, is not used to dilute the cereal. 
Whole milk is not given to a child until they are over the age of one year. Up until that age, they are on formula. So formula would be used to mix a cereal or water if the mother's breastfeeding and does not have milk to use. Vegetables are the second item that would be added to the food list. And fruits come in third. I've had mothers ask me before, why do I have to give my child vegetables before fruit? I'd much sooner give them a little bit of applesauce. The theory behind this is a child develops their taste based on the order of food items we give them. And if in fact we were to give them fruit before vegetables, they would not develop a taste for the flat taste that is in a vegetable. And in fact would develop sweet tastes prematurely. We want to start with vegetables first. The other consideration here, frequently fruit items can cause allergies. Orange juice and oranges is a fruit that is not advanced early in this stage group. In fact, it is actually held onto until a later time, usually over the age of one year. Let's go on and look at our food list. Potatoes is another food item that can be added following fruit. This can be in the order of french fries, but remember, these should not be such small pieces of french fry that the child would choke. Meats are advanced after we have completed cereals and fruits and vegetables. Meats are not usually given until after the age of six months. And here we are looking at being able to grind the meat up so that we can almost to a mashed consistency. It definitely is not the way we would eat a meat, but it's the only safe way to give meat to a child. Meats can be ground in your blender or in a small food grinder that can be bought at any baby care store. When you're thinking of how to prepare foods for the child, it's important once they are on this type of a list of food items to give them what you are eating, grind them up, and feed them the things that the family is eating. It helps them develop a diverse taste. Let's go on and look at the rest of our list. Eggs becomes a real concern, and eggs carry the risks of a high allergy. We know that when we give a child an, a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, it's very important to make sure they do not have an allergy to eggs. Eggs are not given during the first 12 months of period. This usually hits much later on. Food items also are advanced one at a time per week. Again, this bullet will give you a reminder that orange juice and tomato juice should not be given until after the first year. Children under the age of six months are usually also not advised to have juice. Again, we are developing a sweet taste before the child's taste buds can be fully developed. Another warning I'd like to add in here is that many families use honey as a substitute for sugar. Honey should never be given to a child under the age of one year because of the risk of botulism. Now we're going to move out of some of these developmental tasks and move into the area of looking at stages of separation or anxiety. We're going to begin with protest. Now who protests and what is a protest? We have seen this in children, usually at the age of two. If you're lucky enough to scoot past it there, you will definitely see it at four. And unfortunately, our even years tend to carry more protests than um, cooperation. Protest presents a screaming and crying and inconsolable behavior. Despair would be another sign of separation anxiety. And as much as we look at these as something that occurs in infancy, we know that we can see this behavior throughout even school-aged children. Despair can be seen as a disinterest in food or play. The child appears withdrawn. They clench to anything that's a security object. Children brought into the emergency room that are appearing to suffer from separation anxiety or neglect may hold on to that teddy bear and not reach for the mother during the exam that we're trying to perform. Denial would be another type of separation anxiety. Denial is, is presented when they ignore their, their parents and are resigned and do not protest the care that's going on around them. They are yet not content either. What are some of the other problems that can develop in infancy? I've talked about safety issues. We've talked about children that are not getting attention or for whatever reason are feeling anxious from separation. Children having separation anxiety like we just discussed are not always children that are being neglected. They could have a family member, a parent who is ill or another sibling who is ill disrupting the normal family routine. They feel like they're being separated so anxiety will develop. But let's look at some other problems that the infant may see. Some of the things that can happen is injury. When we look at injury, the first thing we should think of, especially in relationship to the NCLEX, is prevention. How do we prevent injury in the child? Supervision becomes hallmark. 
Also, observing parenting skills so that abuse does not take place will help prevent injury. Failure to thrive or to develop could be a twofold problem. Do they have the, the money that they need to provide the food and comfort items that the child needs to develop normally? Or does a child have a developmental problem that is preventing them from gaining weight and meeting their developmental tasks on a normal scale? Another type of problem from infancy includes developmental delays. And we've been talking about these across the spectrum. What causes developmental delays? Developmental delays can occur when a family does not have the knowledge that they need to identify what the child should be doing. They may not know that it's time for the child to have blocks to play with. They may not know to take the child into the kitchen with them during dinner and have them eat at the table to watch what socialization is taking place. They also at this time, as far as developmental delays, may have a genetic problem or developmental task as far as muscle coordination that has nothing to do with any de neglect or lack of knowledge in the household. It's important for us to teach families what to look for and to be non-judgmental in our approach to trying to educate or correct any problems that are occurring. Now we're going to go and continue to look at the child's development. Next we're going to look at the toddler. Here, remember, we're looking at issues surrounding autonomy versus shame and doubt and encompasses the 18 to 3 year period of time. The 15 month old begins to walk alone. Walk alone at 15 months, not 11 or 12. They can throw an object and we know that they can throw them far. They can hold a spoon and begin to try and feed themselves. As we approach into the 18 month period, the anterior fontanelle now closes, losing one of our assessment tools for identifying dehydration in an infant. Remember, fontanelles can be used to evaluate over and under hydration in children. In the 18 month period, the child also begins to climb stairs and suck their thumb. Their vocabulary at this time usually increases to about 10 words, and we are moving into a period of negativism the nose, the temper tantrums. And what we want to make sure we're doing at this point is trying to distract instead of abuse the child to control them. Let's continue to look at the toddler. During the 24 month period of time, the child at this stage should have about a 300 word vocabulary and be able to obey easy commands that you give them. Pick your toys up, sit in the chair, please stop banging on that. As we approach into the 30 month period of time, the child here can walk on their tiptoes or stand on one foot. They also have developed sphincter control. This does not mean that all children are toilet trained at the age of 30 months, but in fact we should be at least able to begin toilet training at the age of 30 months. Waiting is hard for these children and the norm is very important. Parents that attempt toilet training at a younger age only frustrate themselves and the child and in fact find the child training them more than them training the child. Now what are some toys that can be used for the toddler? Cooking utensils. This does not mean at the stove. These are cooking utensils that they play with next to you in parallel play. Dress up clothing. They love to be like mom or dad or who knows who else. So giving them old jewelry and clothes and shoes to flop around in is a fun idea. Be careful with hats in an open area. We want to watch for head lice. Rocking horses are another type of tool that the child enjoys playing with. Remember, any device that the child sits on should be close to the floor. Finger paints are fun. Finger paints need to be done in a controlled area so that we don't have to then um, correct the child for finger painting on one of the walls in the hallway. And a phonograph cassette player, CD discs, or whatever the latest technology is for noise and music is also fun. It's fun for the child to be able to tape their own voice and listen also not only to their voice but others around them in our absence. Now what are the, some of the potential problems during the toddler period? One of the things we're trying to do here again is continue to give parental education. How do we deal with negativism? And we've talked about trying to be consistent or diverse. We also want to look again here at safety, but in addition to injuries, we have the added problem of poisoning. Children at this age put lots of things in their mouth. It's important to lock cabinets and have things out of the reach of a child who could put something poisonous into their system. Abuse again shows up at this stage. Now let's continue and look at a little later growth and development, that of the preschool child. 
As we get into the preschool period, we're looking at children up to the age of six years. Initiative versus guilt. The three-year-old child wants to be cooperative. They begin to want to help. They can ride a tricycle or big wheel. They can undress without any assistance. The unfortunate thing is when they appear in your dining room totally undressed at your dinner party, not able to get those pajamas on, but they really did want to help. They also may invent an imaginary friend, and we don't want to discourage this imaginary friend. They communicate, they identify, and they develop through this friend. As we look at a four-year-old child, they're at this stage able to lace their shoes, begin to tie them as long as the only thing they have is Velcro. They also can brush their teeth. They need supervision to make sure it's done completely, but they need to have the opportunity to develop independence as well. At this point, they can throw overhand, but anyone that's been on a baseball field watching a t-ball game knows that their overhand throw is not very strong. Preschool children, as we get into the age group of five, are able to run well, and they run very well. They run on a baseball field from first base to second base, not knowing when they're supposed to stop. They can dress now without help, thank goodness, during the dinner party. They also begin with cooperative play, the team sports, and start to develop some gender-specific behaviors. This does not mean that we need to have gender-specific toys only. Boys enjoy playing with dolls as much as a girl enjoys having a truck and making truck noises. This is normal development. Now, what types of things can we use for toys for the preschooler? One of the first ones that should come to mind is active type toys, playground materials, swings and slides, again being careful for climbing, balls that they can play with as, as an individual or in a group, housekeeping type items. Sometimes if you have a lightweight vacuum, they can actually try and vacuum your house. It's a lot safer to give them their own little toy vacuum to vacuum or cut the grass with in the case of a lawnmower. Coloring books are another thing that's fun, not to make them keep within the lines, but to allow them to be creative and color things whatever color they want to use. Again, tricycles and big wheels are a big toy, as well as puppets or dolls. Puppets and dolls can also be used as a teaching piece when children need to be hospitalized. What are some of the potential problems for the preschool period? One of the primary things we see is fear of injury, mutilation, or punishment. These are the children that take the launching jump from the doorway into their bed because they know that there's a monster under it. You can show them, you can climb under it, you are not going to convince them that that monster does not exist. You need to work with them and help them get through this period by letting them feel secure. Leave a night light on. It doesn't make them a sissy because they want to sleep with a light on. What we can do to try and diminish their fears will help them develop into the next stage. Another problem that can occur during this time period is safety. Again, poisonings and injuries. Children think that they are Superman and can jump from stairs that are too high and dangerous when they land. Now let's advance and look at the school age child. The child that is in the 6 to 12 year period of time looking at industry versus inferiority. The six-year-old child is self-centered. He is a show-off and usually rude. Please and thank you is not part of their normal vocabulary. They're very sensitive to criticism, although they are very critical of people around them. They begin losing their te um, temporary teeth at this time and will not smile for school pictures unless trying to appear goofy. They also begin to be somewhat independent, which is what is driving this self-centered behavior. As we approach the seven-year period of time, children are much more helpful. They seem to mellow out. They enjoy team games and sports and have developed a concept of time. They prefer to play at this stage, usually with someone of the same sex. Remember, during this time period, these children are asking lots of why questions. They also have begun to really observe the environment around them. Children learn what they see and they copy these behaviors. Let's make sure that they're healthy behaviors that they're copying. Let's look at some more development in the school-age child. As we get into the eight-year period, we look for a child who's seeking out friends. They would sooner spend time with their friends oftentimes now than mom or dad. They begin writing, um, which replaces the printing that they've done. And this can be a frustrating task for children who do not have good hand-eye coordination. Vision problems may appear during this eight- and nine-year period of time since eye development should have completed. Also, children may develop some identity problems if they are the only one in the class wearing glasses. During this nine-year period, we will also see conflicts between peer groups and parents. 
Children want to do what their friends are doing and they don't want their parents to say they're not allowed. There's also conflicts during this period of time between independence and dependence. They want your help one minute and the next minute they want you to get away and let them do it themselves. They usually, at least hopefully, like school and have just begun to get into the area of what they're able to learn. Now as we advance a little further, we're going to look at the issues around the 10 to 12 year old child and what are their developmental tasks. One thing that comes into play almost immediately is the use of the telephone, if they even wait until this time period. They are usually increasingly responsible and by the age of 12 can babysit, shovel driveways, or carry out a job for a neighbor and do it responsibly. They begin to develop interest in the opposite sex and may state, quote, I have a boyfriend or girlfriend. They love conversation, in fact, will monopolize the entire dinner table discussions. Helpful is a good age to try and keep them in because as we transition out of the school age period into adolescence, we know that helpful is not a word that quickly comes to mind. Now, what are some of the toys that a child in the school age period might use? They probably don't want them referred to, though, as toys. One of the first things or anything that they can build with. You know, we go from Legos and Brillo box to constructs to tinker toys. Remember, again, these should be safe things for them to be building with. They should not be constructing with their father's skill saw. Pets are also something that children begin to beg for if they don't exist in your home. Even if it's a turtle, a gerbil, or a fish, they want the responsibility and the opportunity to take care of something. Games are also, and these are board games as well as outdoor sporting games, and of course we could add computer games. Books need to be appropriate for the child's age. They need to be reading things that are school age material, not adult material. Bicycles are also something that a child should be at this point in time able to do. A two-wheel bike is something that they enjoy getting around on. They can be independent and they can get around to a friend's house without us having to walk or get them there. They do need to be aware of wearing a helmet and to watch the cars if they're using the street as their mode of transportation. Let's go on and look at some other potential problems that can occur during the school age period. Enuresis is what they call bedwetting. Children do not always toilet train successfully at the age of three or four, and during changes in weather or illness may in fact wet the bed. They should not be belittled during this, but supported. Encopesis would be incontinence of stool, and the same types of in, uh, information would hold true here as well. Safety as far as injury and head lice, which would come from sharing brushes and combs, wigs and hats, are a problem during this time period. Children continue during the school age period to oftentimes be afraid of the dark. The night light does not um, hurt to continue to use in their room or in the hallway if necessary. It also serves as a safety feature. Another problem during this period is fights. Children may come home having been beaten up or having beaten up someone else. Puberty has begun and teaching about mood swings needs to occur both between the parents and within the children as well so they can understand. Now let's look at the next challenging age group, adolescents. During adolescence, the child goes into puberty, which is a rapid alteration in height and weight. They develop secondary sex characteristics and are very preoccupied with their physical appearance. Their body image becomes a paramount focus of their time, and they are concerned with such things as obesity or acne. Adolescence' complete, um, complete development of secondary sex characteristics continues, and they improve with motor coordination. As we look at this time period, we need to be aware of what's going on both within the male and the female. So let's look quickly at a list of um, characteristics we would see both in the male and female person. Nail changes, increase in genital size. They have pubic, facial, axillary, and chest hair, although not at the age of 12. And a deepening voice. And remember, the deepening voice can take spikes, where all of a sudden it's very high-pitched and embarrassing. They may have nocturnal emissions, as well as they do not know, because of this size, when, how long their arm is or how long their stride is and may actually bump into a doorway. Females, on the other hand, have different types of development. They have breast development and axillary and pubic hair. Menarche, or the first menstrual period, occurs during this time period. Now, where are we trying to go with this material? What do we want the adolescent to understand? When we begin to look at psychosocial type problems of this age group, what might we see? We're going to see masturbation, sexual fantasies, and experimental sexual intercourse. Children in this adolescent period are attempting to identify sexually where they fit. 
We're also going to see in the psychosocial developmental areas where they could begin to conform to peer pressure, the use of drugs, experimental smoking, and again, experimental sex. They become very moody. They don't know where they fit, and they have an increasing need for independence. They want to work. They want to know where their future is going to bring them. They want to know what kind of a trade they could take on or what college they want to go to. What are the potential problems of the adolescent period? Most of us know these, but let's quickly look at a list. Adolescent pregnancy, STDs. Poor self-image. Safety. Remember, they are driving or riding in, in automobiles. Automobile accidents, as well as diving accidents, would be another issue. Drug and alcohol misuse or use at all. And AIDS. AIDS, again, would extend into other sexually transmitted diseases. Children at this stage may decide to drop out of school. They become involved in violence or involved in gangs. Here we need to look at issues that will help this child decrease their stress, increase their identity, become non-suicidal, and yet pick up on those stages during their ups and downs. Remember, children can be depressed. Children can attempt suicide. Let's move on and look at the young adult. During the young adult period, the 20 to 33-year-old range, well, here we're looking at an increased reality. They're aware of what's going on around them, as well as marriage, partnership, and the peaking of intelligence and memory. There's an overlap in this young adult period, and between the ages of 33 and 40, we also go into a period of increased sense of urgency, and major goals, hopefully at this point in time, have been accomplished. They have discovered who they are. They understand where their future is taking them, and they've been able to build on that. There's a sense of satisfaction developing. During the next period of young adulthood, when we're looking at the 35 to 45 year old, we're looking at reappraisal of where they are and where they're going with their life. They are self-questioning. They also are fearful of what middle age and aging may bring, not only with loneliness, but with finances and whether or not they're on track with where they would like to be. The sandwich generation are those individuals dealing not only with their identity issues, but those of aging children and aging parents. They share responsibility both up and down the age scale. There's also an increased awareness of our mortality, and it's important for us to identify where we want to be. Now, what are some of the problems associated with this young adult period? And being in it, I enjoy the, peri the time period being called young adult. Here we have issues surrounding difficulty with relationships and stress. Stress can promote oftentimes many diseases to develop, and it's important for us to try and help individuals use those healthy behaviors we've been talking about um, throughout this tape series. Exercise, rest, nutrition. Now let's continue and look at some of the other things that we need to know about growth and development. Changes that occur with aging are a frequently tested item on the NCLEX. What is happening during the middle adult and aging years? It's important for you to be able to understand both the norms during this time period and the abnormals. Remember that aging adults may have elasticity problems of the skin that are expected. Although not normal in all individuals, it is normal for their age group. Let's look at the age group of 45 to 55. Here we have graying hair and wrinkling skin, pains and muscle aches, reassessments as far as where we're going in life as, and our goals and dreams, and um, in the female case, menopause. There is a decreased sensory acuity here, requiring sometimes the use of glasses for near or far vision, bifocals for both, and hearing aids. As we go into the next age group, we're going to be looking at the 48 to 60 year old, who at this point in time is evaluating their past and setting new goals for the future. They're trying to define the values of their life. They're looking for serenity and fulfillment to take into their later years. Now let's continue to look at the 60 to 65 year old adult. In the 60 to 65 year old range, we have someone with increasing physical decline, increasing forgetfulness, Modifications of the lifestyle must take place at this time. They reevaluate re their values and their activities and are trying to find some enjoyment in the potential retirement that's approaching. Illness and death of a partner could occur during this time period. What are some of the other potential problems during this middle adult period? Decreased cognitive and physical functioning has been identified. Thought process as well as our ability to carry out tasks. This does not mean they need to become immobile. 
altered family relationships, children that move far away, or estrangement that can occur, or death. Self-care deficits, the inability to take care of yourself or the inability to control bodily function. Women with stress incontinence would have a self-care deficit that can be adapted. When we're looking at an altered body image, this is also something that, that individuals have difficulty with. You can picture the aged adult who's had a stroke, and when they look in the mirror, they can see their shoulder drooping and their arm drooping and feel that the half of their body cannot function. This affects self-image, just like the individual who says successfully combated cancer, but is left with a colostomy bag and colostomy care that needs to be done on a daily basis. We need to make sure that we promote individuals looking at the positive pieces of their development, not the negative pieces. Let's move on and look at integrity versus despair issues around late adulthood. 60 to 80 year old individuals during the aging process continue to decline physically and usually have a loss of significant others, not just their maybe marital partner, but friends and siblings around them, hopefully not their children. Appearance of chronic illnesses appear at this time and they begin to look at their own mortality. There's changes in their social roles and they may find themselves isolated. Thinking about isolation brings us to an area where we can look at the problems associated with this time period. In addition to self-care deficits, the inability to care for oneself or even one's spouse, and isolation can cause depression. Relationships become altered and there's a decrease in independence. Aging individuals do not enjoy relying on their children to take care of them and want to maintain some sense of independence in their life. It's important for us to teach the children of aging parents how to promote independence so that people can remain positive in their outlook. Now let's go on now and look at some developmental areas that have been delayed and we're going to begin with mental retardation in the mild form. Mental retardation in the mild form includes an IQ from 55 to 70 an individual that is slow to walk, feed themselves, or talk, but is capable of learning to read, do math skills with special education, usually up through the third to sixth grade level, which would be an eight to 12 year old knowledge base. They can also achieve some type of social or vocational self maintenance, which means living in a group home that could carry a job. We've seen these individuals work in the community as gardeners or working at like McDonald's. They are trainable. Now let's look at the difference as we progress into a moderate mental retardation. Here the IQ decreases to that of 40 to 55. They have delays in motor development, although they can still do some activities with assistance. They res can respond to training, but the training must be at a lower level. We're looking at a young child's um, development age here. They are poor with communication skills and need to have a very sheltered environment. This individual is incapable of self-maintenance. They need direction to accomplish the skills that they're going to achieve. Let's compare this now to the severely mentally retarded individual. Here we have an IQ of 25 to 40 with a marked delay in development. Also, this individual is incapable of carrying out very many self-help type skills, but will profit from habit training in order, in other words, teaching them what they need to do at one time of the day based on their skills. Some understanding of speech exists, but again, you must remember that we're talking about an individual who really has the developmental skills of a toddler. They are very dependent on others for their care, and but can conform to a routine. They have some understanding. Now, as we look at the mental retardation in the profound form, we're going to find somebody who is severely restricted in the ability to carry out any tasks of um, daily living. Here we have an individual with an IQ less than 25, with a minimal capacity for any type of functioning. This individual is infant-like, but they can again respond to some skill training and may show some basic emotional responses, tearfulness and excitedness, but without limits. They are incapable of any self-maintenance and need complete nursing care. Now an example of a type of mental retardation would be an individual who may have had the genetic aberration that would cause Down syndrome. So we're going to look quickly at Down syndrome. Down syndrome, when we assess, is an individual that presents with some mental retardation as a result of hyp and hypotonia. Hypotonia means poor muscle control or weakness. They have an altered physical development and decreased strengths. Remember, this comes from an excess of, a cr of chromosome 21. Implementation during this 
with these types of individuals include providing stimulation, assessing the physical problems around them, and then doing some parental education. These individuals benefit from occupational and physical therapy, can be trained to carry a job and work in a group home, depending on their level of limitations, and benefit from some type of training. Parents need to get education on how to prevent this from occurring in the future and looking at genetic tendencies around this disease. Now let's continue to go further and look at some other learning disabilities. When we identify individuals with an, a learning disability such as ADD, attention deficit disorder, or ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, we find individuals that are hyperkinetic. They, have, they are like action in motion. They have a decreased attention span and have perceptual defects. When we try to implement some actions with these individuals, we need to get them involved in some form of special education intervention. This does not mean isolating them in another classroom, but teaching them limitations and conformities and how to adapt to where their limitations are or their needs are. They may require medications. Again, medication, one example would be Ritalin. There is also support groups. Support groups are used to try and help not only the child deal with the frustrations they experience, but to also help them compensate for the problem. Parents are encouraged to go into support groups as well, so they can give the child the freedom and independence to learn to handle their problem and limit their behaviors themselves. Consistency and in expectations and behavior and schedule become important. Now this finishes the section on growth and development. Now we're going to proceed into an area on childbearing. We'll begin with the normal childbearing process. Within the normal childbearing process, what you need to know include how to calculate estimated date of confinement or delivery and terms such as gravita, para, term, abortion, quickening, lightening, effacement, and dilatation. In addition, you need to know the normal weight gain during pregnancy as well as the presumptive, probable, and positive signs of pregnancy. Let's begin by looking at some of the issues that around, center around human sexuality. As we begin to look at this, we see that human sexuality involves sexual relationships and our self-concept, which we have talked about how that develops. We do not want to allow personal beliefs to interfere with our ability to help an individual patient or client identify where they sit in this, in this module. We need to remain non-judgmental in their treatment options and decisions around parenting and pregnancy. And we need to provide them adequate information to make informed decisions. Now, as we get into this next area, we're going to be looking at the EDC, Estimated Date of Confinement or Due Date. This is frequently tested on the NCLEX. Let's look at the slide. Nagel's rule is what is called when we figure out when the estimated date of confinement or delivery is going to be. What we would do here with Nagel's rule is take the last menstrual period, subtract three months, add seven days, and then add one year. In the example of an individual whose last menstrual period was on January 10th, we would subtract three months, come up with October, add seven days, come up with the 10th, and add one year, 1999. Another type of point that we need to understand in, in determining development or birth is the ultrasound. Head measurements can be used to determine how far along the pregnancy has gone and how the development of the baby is taking place. Fundal height is also used. Once the fundus is above the symphysis pubis, we are looking at developmental stages in the 12 to 14 week. At the umbilicus, or 20 centimeters of growth, the 20th week, and rising one centimeter per week up until the 36th week, until it rises well out of the um, pubic area. Now, as we move into the next terms, we're going to be looking at some obstetrical classifications. Let's begin by looking at gravida. Gravida is the number of pregnancies regardless of the duration and includes the present pregnancy. Para is the number of pregnancies that go beyond the period of viability into or including 20 weeks or 500 grams. Term is an infant who will be born beginning at the 30th 38th week up until the 42nd week. Abortion is a term used to describe termination of pregnancy before viability. Now, what we need to look at here, especially in relationship to an issue like abortion, abortion here is not talking about just termination of the pregnancy, but can be a spontaneous happening. So we need to make sure we remain non-judgmental. Now let's continue to look at some of the terminologies associated with obstetrics. 
Chadwick's sign is the bluish discoloration of the cervix or softening that occurs early in the pregnancy. Striae gravidium is a pink or reddish streaks or stretch marks that occur on the abdomen as the uterus enlarges with the growth of the baby. Clausema is the increased pigmentation on the face or brown areas that develop. Linea nigra is a dark line that forms from the umbilicus to the symphysis pubis. And quickening, which is the maternal perception of movement that occurs sometime between the 16th and 20th week of gestation. Now the next area we're going to move into is what is the normal weight gain during pregnancy. Let's begin with the first trimester. The first trimester we would expect to see the pregnant mom increase from 2 to 4 pounds in weight. The second tri trimester 12 to 14 and the third 8 to 12. Now once we begin to see this weight gain or the cessation of menstruation, the individual may seek out some medical care. At least that would be our goal. Let's look at some of the signs of pregnancy. We're going to be begin with presumptive signs or subjective or suspicions of pregnancy. The first symptom is amenorrhea. The period stops or changes in its characteristics. There is morning sickness, quickening, remember that movement, and an urgency with urination. This is from distension of the uterus. As we move into the area of more probable signs or increased suspicion, we start to look at issues surrounding things like uterine enlargement, the positive urine pregnancy test, and Chadwick sign. Remember, that's the bluishness or softness of the cervix. Some of the positive signs where we know that pregnancy is present or de definitive include picking up the fetal heart tone, usually at 12 weeks by adoptone, or 18 to 20 weeks um, through auscultation with the stethoscope, palpation of fetal movements, both by the physician, not just by the mother, and the outline of the, physical, the fetal skeleton. This is not something that's routinely done, and we do not rush in to do x-rays to find a fetus. Ultrasound would be used to determine the presence of the baby. Now, as we proceed into the next area, we're going to look at some of the things you need to know on the NCLEX associated with childbearing. These are frequently tested items. Let's begin with the first one. Normal fetal assessment findings. Second, how to care for the discomforts during pregnancy, what the mom should be taught. Pre and post care for amniocentesis, ultrasound, non-stress test, and contraction stress test. The last thing that we're going to talk about in this point will be danger signs associated with pregnancy, or when do we know that a problem is going to exist. Now, we're going to start back by looking at fetal assessment. How do we, develop, how do we evaluate the development of the fetus in utero? Let's begin by looking at fetal heart rates. In utero, the fetal heart rate, FHR, is normally between 110 and 160 beats per minute. Once the heart rate increases above 160, we're dealing with tachycardia, and if below 110 beats per minute, bradycardia. This is used to predict fetal well-being. Additionally, we're going to be looking at fetal movements. Regular fetal movements are a pattern of 10 movements in a 20-minute to 2-hour period of time. The mom should be taught to report any less than 3 movements in an hour time period. Remember, during this phase, we should be encouraging the mom to seek out prenatal help. Prenatal care is a social time. They talk to other moms that are pregnant and share remedies in treating some of the discomforts. Now let's talk about what suggestions we can give them for treating discomforts and how to handle them. The first one is morning sickness. Dry crackers and eating small frequent meals are effective any time during the day, not just the morning. Constipation, increasing fiber in the diet and fluid, is the same treatment we would use for anyone, including the mom. Leg cramps oftentimes occur because of a low calcium intake, increasing the calcium and exercising, such as flexing the feet if sitting at a desk for a long period, are helpful. Other discomfort treatments that we can use for breast soreness is making sure the mom is using a well-fitting bra, or if complaining of backache, is looking at her posture and the types of shoes that she's wearing. High heels are not a good idea, safety or posture-wise, during pregnancy. Heartburn is another complaint, and acids can help this, as well as decreasing the fatty and fried foods in the diet. Moms also will occasionally complain of urinary tract infections, usually resulting from not urinating when needed or not taking enough fluids in, as well as some shortness of breath. Remember, movements and positioning can help with shortness of breath. Let's move and look at a few other discomforts associated with pregnancy. 
dizziness can occur and if we encourage the mom to have slow deliberate movements she will have less of a problem with dizziness support stockings are also helpful in helping with dizziness in that they help the venous return to the heart vertigo is another problem when the mother um, develops dizziness especially when doing a Leopold maneuver during the exam having her turn to her left side gets the baby off that vena cava helps with the blood flow and the dizziness can be relieved urinary frequency can be diminished by teaching the mom to kegel that is where you tighten the pelvic floor muscles it helps not only with preventing urinary frequency now but in later years and with healing process following the delivery now let's begin next by looking at some of the developmental, some of, I'm sorry, the, some of the diagnostic tests associated with identifying problems in the developing fetus. The first test we're going to look at is the amniocentesis. The amniocentesis is an invasive procedure that can be done at 16 weeks gestation to detect genetic disorders, at 30 weeks to determine lung maturity and LS or LS ratio, and, like I had said before, is an invasive procedure requiring a permit. The mom is encouraged to void before the procedure. She is also uh, necessary for us to determine the position of both the placenta and the fetus with ultrasound before the needle is inserted and fluid removed off of that um, uterus. Complications associated with an amniocentesis include premature labor, infection, and RH isoimmunization. A mom who is RH negative will be given Rogam if this procedure is attempted in order to prevent the development of antibodies to RH positive blood if the fetus was RH positive. Now let's move on and look at another diagnostic test, the ultrasound. The ultrasound is used at five weeks of gestation to determine pregnancy and can determine not only pregnancy but also the position, the number of fetuses, and the structure of the fetus itself. In order for this test to be accomplished successfully, the mom needs to have a full bladder, which means drinking two to three liters of liquid, minimum of one, and this helps with the clarity of the image. It gives them a landmark. This is not an invasive procedure, would not require a permit, and is fun for the mom and dad to see because they get to see the baby as it's developing. Sex can sometimes be determined depending on the position of the baby during the ultrasound. A non-stress test is the next piece of it we're going to look at. The non-stress test is done after 28 weeks and records fetal movements as well as the heart rate. The client should be eating snacks. Remember, they are exercising. And when we evaluate the response, a favorable response would be when the individual or the mom has experienced two or more increases or accelerations in the fetal heart tone or rate of 15 beats or more lasting 15 seconds over a 20-minute interval or period of time. Now let's go on to compare this to a contraction stress test. The contraction stress test is used to evaluate the fetal response to stress of labor. It's performed after 28 weeks gestation with the mom in a semi-fowlers or side-lying position. Here we're looking at stimulating the baby and evaluating its response without having them on like a treadmill. A positive response is a late deceleration with at least 50% of the contractions indicating a potential risk to the fetus. We will talk later about what late deceleration means. A favorable response would be no late decelerations or decrease in heart rate with a minimum of three contractions lasting 40 to 60 seconds in a 10 minute period of time. Additional tests that we could be using would be an estriol test, which would show the aging of the placenta, and we could have also done some other genetic testing before even attempting the amniocentesis. Now let's move into some of the danger signs of pregnancy. Gushing of fluid or bleeding from the vagina should signal to the mom that she needs to seek attention, as well as the development of any regular uterine contractions. Severe headaches, visual disturbances, abdominal pain, or persistent vomiting would be signs of pregnancy-induced hypertension and potentially seizure activity. They need to notify their physician. Fever and chills could indicate infection, and swelling of the hands and feet could indicate the development of a cardiac-type problem. 
Now, in our teaching, we're not only going to explain to the mom how to treat her discomforts, what to look for as danger signs, but also what to do with the onset of labor. Let's move into the onset of labor. Onset of labor is determined when they experience lightning. First-time moms, or those that are primapara, can experience lightning up to two weeks before delivery. Multiparous or multiple pregnancy moms experiencing more than one pregnancy in the past may not experience lightning until labor begins. Softening of the cervix occurs, and there's expulsion of the mucus plug or show. Uterine contractions also will be a sign of the onset of labor. Now, what other types of things are occurring at the sign that beginning of labor or just prior to its start? Let's look at what happens with the cervix. The cervix at the beginning of labor will efface. Remember that effacement is a progressive thinning and shortening or drawing up of the cervix, leading into the dilatation. The cervix must efface or shorten before it can begin to open completely for delivery. Some of the other in information that you need to know as we start to look at the, child, the normal childbirthing period are symptoms that are associated with or care of a mom who would present with a prolapse cord, as well as reassuring and non-reassuring fetal heart patterns. Now let's move on and look at some of the things that we would do for a mom that may develop symptoms of a prolapse cord. At this point, you must remember that the mom has been in labor. She will have gone through lightening, quickening, there would have been some cervical changes, and there may be rupture of her membranes, ROM. In this case, ROM would not stand for range of motion. It stands for rupture of membranes. The fetal heart tones would need to be assessed. Now let's look at some of the symptoms of a prolapse cord following the rupture of the membranes. Premature rupture of membranes can promote a prolapse cord. The baby is too high in the pelvis and the cord falls down in front of its head before it engages in the pelvis. The presenting part was not engaged and fetal distress or changes in heart patterns can be indicative of a prolapse cord. As a contraction occurs, the baby puts pressure on the cord with its head or presenting part, cutting off its oxygen supply. A protruding cord would obviously be a sign of a prolapse cord. Now we need to move into what should the nurse do once this is identified. Let's look at care of the prolapse cord mom. Call for help immediately and push against the presenting, the presenting part, not the cord, the presenting part. Get the cord, the presenting part off of the cord. Place the mom in the Trendelenburg or knee chest position. Use gravity to raise the pelvis. Get the baby to slide upward and get them off the cord. You have been successful in treating this problem if the fetal heart tones have remained unchanged. They have not become depressed. The baby is not hypoxic. Now let's start to look at some of the problems that the may baby may present with during this period. We're going to begin by looking at tachycardia. Tachycardia, remember, is an increase in heart rate above 160 beats per minute, lasting longer than 10 minutes. Begin, it is an early sign of fetal hypoxia, and this is important for you to remember. Tachycardia or any type of cardiac changes can be picked up through intermittently assessing the baby as well as the baby that is on a continuous fetal monitor. When we're looking at um, maternal fever, it's going to cause the baby's heart rate to go up as well, as well as fetal anemia. We talked about anemia in previous tapes, or you will see them in future tapes on physiologic adaptation. Anemia causes tachycardia. Fetal and maternal infections will cause tachycardia, and it is a non-reassuring sign when it's associated with late deceleration, severe variable deceleration, or absence of variability. Remember, we will talk about these in a few minutes. Now let's talk a minute about the opposite, bradycardia. Bradycardia occurs when the baby's heart rate drops below 110 beats per minute, lasting longer than 10 minutes. Remember, we're not responding to one small incident of changes in the baby's heart rate. We all do that. But when we have sustained changes, it's a sign for danger. We need to move. Bradycardia is a very late sign of fetal hypoxia. You missed the tachycardia. 
maternal drugs, anesthetics can cause bradycardia as well as the, a prolonged cord compression, whether it is prolapsed or not. Remember that cord can prolapse into the pelvis prior to the baby's engagement and not be visible from the outside. Maternal hypotension can cause bradycardia in the baby and again remember when the mom complains of dizziness or hypotension is picked up, we turn her to her left side. Bradycardia, it would be a non-reassuring sign when it's associated with a loss of variability and again, late deceleration. Now we're going to move into the concept of what is variability? What are these late and early decelerations and what do they mean? Let's begin by looking at a variability. Variability is normally irregular cardiac rhythms. Normally it's changed from 6 to 10 beats per minute. This means that normal variability would be a baby whose heart rate is averaging around 140 plus or minus 6 to 10 beats per minute. It indicates fetal well-being. It is absent in 0 to 2 changes, decreased in 3 to 5, and this would be when it's associated with fetal sleep or prematurity, drugs, or hypoxia. Remember, normal variability is 6 to 10 beats per minute. Slight changes are not going to be a problem, but need to be monitored. Increased variability would be when we see a heartbeat changing more than 25 beats per minute and is associated with early mild hypoxia or fetal stimulation. It could be something that the mom actually had eaten or drank. Now, when we compare variability to accelerations, we're going to be looking at beats per minute. When we look at accelerations, 15 beats per minute rise above the baseline followed by a return. Acceleration is what happens during a contraction. As the mom's uterus contracts and compresses the baby in uterus, the heart rate should normally increase. But this increase should only be 15 beats per minute and should return back to the baseline in a normal period of time. Accelerations indicate fetal well-being and are sometimes caused by fetal movements in addition to the contractions I've described. It can also be seen frequently with breech presentations. Now we're going to get into next some of the changes that can occur with deceleration or decreases in heart rate. Let's begin by looking at an early deceleration. The key here is being able to interpret where the deceleration or decrease occurs. An early deceleration occurs before the peak or the point of maximum impulse of the contraction. It's a mirror image of the contraction. The baby's heart rate increases as the contraction increases in intensity. It's usually associated with head compression and can also be associated with pushing during the next stage of labor. This is a reassuring pattern and should be seen in a healthy fetus during labor. Late decelerations, in contrast, are not a healthy sign and it's important to understand how to recognize these. Late decelerations occur um, following the onset of the contraction is established and it's slow to return to the baseline. Now let's relook at this statement. Onset after the contraction. I said earlier that accelerations and decelerations should occur to mirror the contraction. This one starts late and it's very slow to come back to the baseline. The baby is not rebounding well. It is the low point of deceleration occurs after the peak of the contraction. Again, not mirroring a normal flow. We want these waves to look similar. Late decelerations can be caused by pregnancy-induced hypertension, maternal diabetes, placenta previa, as well as abruptio placenta, and we will talk about these in length later. A non-reassuring sign of a date late deceleration is associated with fetal hypoxia and acidosis. We need to move on signs and symptoms of late deceleration. The baby is in danger. Its viability is, in, is concerned. So let's go on now and look at what do we do for an infant in labor that shows signs of late deceleration. Change the mother's position. If the baby is laying on her vena cava, the baby is not getting enough oxygen. Also, the baby could be compressing its own cord. Getting the mom to change may shift the positioning of the baby. Elevate the mom's legs. Let's increase the venous return. Let's elevate the baby in the pelvis slightly, changing its position. We're going to increase the IV rate, eliminating any hypotension that could be occurring in the mom. 
we will administer oxygen to make sure that the child is not deficient, and we will discontinue the use of any oxytocin, which we would be using to help increase the contractions. Oxytocin should be eliminated or discontinued immediately upon any signs of late deceleration. The mom should also be prepared for cesarean section or emergency delivery of the baby. Now the third type of deceleration we're going to talk about is a variable deceleration. Variable decelerations occur when there's a transient decrease in fetal heart tones or heart rate occurring any time during the uterine contraction phase. It can be caused or indicated in cord compression and can be relieved by the changes in the mom's position again. Again, any time we see changes in deceleration outside of the early stage or occurring before the peak of the contraction, we need to administer oxygen. We need to protect the baby from any danger. Variable decelerations, the baby's heart rate does not near the mom's contractions. In other words, as the contraction increases, the baby's heart rate is all over the scale. We need to monitor this, and anytime we have abnormal decelerations, notify the physician immediately. Now let's go on to look at some of the other things we need to know about normal childbearing. First, how to determine lie, presentation, position, or station of the fetus. Timing and characteristics of the contraction. And characteristics of true and false labor. Let's begin by looking at lie. Lie refers to where the baby is laying in the pelvis in relationship to the mom's landmarks. Let's look at how we determine this. When we look at lie, we're looking at the relationship of the spine of the fetus to the mom. If the baby is in a left-sided position, the baby's back or spine is against the mom's left side of the pelvis. Longitudinal has to do with the relationship of the baby in line also with these landmarks. Is the baby up and down or pointing head down or bottom down or are they laying side to side, which would be a transverse. Transverse is the side to side position of the baby and oblique. Now let's go on to look at some positioning related to this. Presentation of the baby. Presentation refers to the part of the fetus that enters the maternal pelvic inlet. This can be in the cephalic or vertex position or head down, or O or B in the case of a brow. Breach position, such as the buttocks, which would be referred to as S when we identify them. And shoulder, which would be SC when identified. Transverse would use a criteria of T. Position should be looked at because we are going to have to chart how this baby is laying. It helps us identify where the baby is and where we can better pick up their fetal heart tones. Let's go on to look at some positioning issues. Position refers again to the relationship of the fetal reference point to the maternal pelvis. Three letter abbreviations are used. In this case, LOP stands for a baby laying with its spine against the left side of the mother's pelvis, presenting with the occiput or head, and in the posterior or P position. Posterior meaning that the baby is laying in the mom facing the pubic bone or facing up. Some countries call this sunny side up. ROA, the baby would be laying on the right side, again presenting with the head, but in the A position is facing the back, anterior. This is the better position in that it allows the head to flex on the pelvic bone, decreasing pain and easing delivery. The maternal pelvis is designed right to left and anterior to posterior. It is important for you to understand how to identify these, again, to determine where to hear fetal heart tones. A baby that is head down needs to have its heart tones tested below the umbilicus. A baby that would be breech or head up would be assessed above the umbilicus. If the child is on the right, the stethoscope will go on the right. If on the left, the left. Let's move on and look at stations. It's important with stations to identify the landmarks. The top two landmarks that are prominent in this picture are the iliac crest. Underneath them, the ischial spines, and beneath those, the ischial tuberosities. At the demarcation of zero on this scale of one to five minus and one to five plus tells us where the baby is in the pelvis. A baby that is above the ischial spines is in the minus stage or is not engaged. A baby that has reached the ischial spines or progresses below is in the positive stage and is on its way out of the body. Let's go on to look at 
the phases of contractions. Phases contractions are looked at as far as increment, which we're looking at the beginning of the contraction until the peak, the acne or peak, which is the strongest intensity, and the decrement or the diminishing or intensity of this. It takes on the appearance of a mountain. Now, what are some of the characteristics that we need to evaluate when we're looking at a contraction? The first thing is its frequency. This is the time in minutes from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next, taking in the rest period. Duration is the time in seconds from the beginning to the end of a contraction. And intensity, which is the strength of a contraction. Mild intensity refers to a slight tense or easy to indent um, abdomen. Moderate is a firm fundus, difficult to indent, and a strong contraction is firm or board-like uh, fundus. Now, what you can look at here is the difference between our nose, our chin, and our forehead to remember these differences. Let's go on to compare the differences and similarities between true and false labor. When we look at true labor, we are looking at regular contractions, increasing in frequency, duration, and intensity. There is discomfort that radiates to the back, the contractions do not decrease with rest, and the cervix progressively effaces and dilates. In contrast with false labor, we have irregular contractions, no change in frequency, duration, or intensity. These do not increase, they do not get stronger. There is no radiating discomfort to the back, the discomfort is in the abdomen. The contraction decreases with rest or activity, and there is usually no cervical changes. Now what are some of the other pieces of information that we need to know when looking at, stage, at normal childbearing? The first thing is to be able to have a good understanding of the stages of labor. Also, how to identify and manage fetal distress. Let's begin by looking at the stages of labor. Stages of labor begin with phase one or stage one. This is the beginning of labor to complete dilatation, zero to ten centimeters. Stage two is the complete dilatation to birth of the baby. Stage three, birth to delivery of the placenta. And four, the first four hours after the delivery of the placenta. Now let's begin by going back and looking at the first stage of labor and walking through those phases. The first stage of labor begins with phase one, zero to three centimeters, contractions that are lasting 10 to 30 seconds long, five to 30 minutes apart mild to moderate in intensity, and oftentimes the mom is at home. Phase two, four to seven centimeters, where contractions are 30 to 40 seconds long, have decreased to three to five minutes apart, and have increased to a moderate or strong intensity. When we look at the, third, the next phase of labor, phase three or transition, we're dealing with cervical dilatation, eight to 10 centimeters, contractions that are lasting 45 to 90 seconds long, two to three minutes apart with a very strong intensity. As we transition out of this first stage of labor into the second stage of labor, we're dealing with the baby on its way out through birth of the baby. With the second stage of labor, the first phase is as the baby progresses from stage zero to plus two with contractions two to three minutes apart. They transition into phase two by progressing from two to four station and contractions 2 to 2.5 minutes apart, increase in bloody red show, and an increased urgency or desire to bear down or push. Now let's move on and look at the third phase here or, um, as we move forward. With the next phase, we have the birth at, at plus 4 to birth. We have contractions 1 to 2 minutes apart, and the fetal head becomes visible. There is an increase in urgency to bear down again here or continue to push. Now we're going to transition into the third stage of labor. Third stage of labor includes the delivery of the placenta, its separation, expulsion, and contraction of the uterus, the gush of blood, lengthening of the umbilical cord, and then checking for any remaining fragments of both the placenta or any other material that would be in utero. As we progress from the third stage, we move into the fourth stage of labor, which remember is at four hours after delivery, and here we're evaluating the uh, level of the fundus in relationship to the umbilicus. This will be discussed later. Let's move on to look at fetal distress. In the management of fetal distress, we will turn the mom on her left side. Remember, this is a baby who's presenting with an irregular heart rate. We are going to give her oxygen, 
check for, pro for the cord prolapse, and start an IV. You need to call for help. This is an emergency situation. What do we do in the management of fetal distress in relationship to umbilical cord prolapse? In this case, we are going to elevate the presenting part off of the cord, call for help, place the mom in Trendelenburg or the knee chest position, and administer oxygen, as well as again, start an IV. This baby needs to be hydrated, and the baby needs to be getting oxygen. On top of this, we need to support the mom psychosocially, and as well as letting her know what's going on. Continue to involve the family in a plan of care. Remember that medications are used during delivery and sometimes can prolong it. Keeping the couple aware of what's going on and understanding anesthesia and analgesic use will help them cooperate in our nursing approach. Pain medications like Demerol are not advisable late in labor or during transition. This will end part one of this tape. We will begin with part two by looking at anesthetic agents during labor. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to part two of health promotion and maintenance. We're going to begin this section by looking at anesthetic agents used during labor. Let's begin by looking at inhalants. Nitrous oxide may be used in an emergency situation where the baby needs to be delivered quickly. It would be used intermittently, and there is danger of neonatal depression if used longer than 15 to 20 minutes. This is used quickly and sparingly. The other type of inhalant that may be used is pen pentherane. It's a self-administered inhaler and may cause maternal and fetal depression. Let's go on to look at some of the regional agents that can be used to decrease pain in the mom in labor. Regional lumbar epidural blocks may be used. They are administered in five, with, by giving the mother 500 to 1,000 cc's of IV fluid rapidly over a period of time to prevent maternal hypotension. We know that a mom in labor given a lumbar epidural block may experience hypotension. By giving fluids ahead of time, we prevent the development of this maternal hypotension. Also, while administered, we would want to maintain the mom in a sideline position. If she was to experience mild or moderate hypotension in response to this epidural block, we would again place her in the left lateral position and increase the IV rate as well as giving her some additional oxygen. We would continue to monitor the blood pressure and fetal heart rate initially every one to two minutes for 15 minutes and then every 10 to 15 minutes once we've established that the mom and baby are tolerating it. If severe hypotension was to occur, you could place the mom in Trendelenburg position for two to three minutes. Let's look at another type of anesthetic block called the regional saddle block. The regional saddle block is administered in the sitting position. The mom would remain upright for 30 seconds to two minutes, and again, it may cause some hypotension, fetal hypoxia, thus we would institute hydrating the mom with some IV fluids. As we move forward with this discussion, some of the additional information you would need to know with normal childbearing would be how to assess and care for the newborn, normal behaviors and assessment of the newborn, how to assess whether breastfeeding is taking place effectively, and how to perform the Kegel exercise. Let's go back to point number one, care of the newborn at delivery. We now have the mom having completed the birthing process. What do we need to do? Care of the newborn is initially highlighted with establishing an airway. We also check the APGAR at both one and five minutes. Remember with the APGAR we are looking for cardiac tone, respirations, muscle tone, and reflexes, as well as color, each being given a score. We would clamp the umbilical cord and make sure that the baby remains warm. With all the problems with identification, part of the, every hospital protocol is to place an ID band on both the mom and the baby. Prophylactic medications may be given at this time, such as eye drops or vitamin K injections. Let's look at what is going on with the mom now. During the fourth stage of labor, we refer to this as the four hours after delivery. During this time period, we are looking for monitoring the mom's vi mo vital signs, blood pressure, heart, respiration, and pulse, as well as checking her fundus for its firmness and positioning, as well as looking at her lochia. Initially, vaginal drainage will be 
Rhubar in color, bloody, for day one through three, becomes more cirrus as we progress, taking on a pink brownish color for day four through nine, and becomes alba, which is yellow or white, ten days later. We also want to make sure that we watch when the mom voids for the first time. The first voiding is important to make sure that any anesthetic agents given during the birth to decrease pain has not inhibited her ability to urinate. We also want to look at how the mom is responding to the baby. Is bonding taking place? Her episiotomy would be assessed and we will progress through with giving her such things as Rogam if needed. Remember if she was Rh negative, she would require Rogam to prevent antibody formation with a subsequent pregnancy to a Rh positive fetus. Now let's move forward and look at some of the things the mom would be going through during this postpartum period. If she has chosen to breastfeed, we need to be able to help her prepare for this. So in the antepartum period, we would encourage her to not use soap on her nipples. This will continue into the postpartum period as well. Exposure to air and sun helps to develop toughness of the skin, so with sucking the baby does not create cracking and soreness to the breast. The mother needs to be taught and the nurse needs to also inspect to make sure that there is no redness or swelling of the nipples. Keeping the nipple dry helps to prevent more breakdown, so pads can be used in the bra of a breastfeeding mother. Let's look at some other points associated with breastfeeding. The mother needs to be in the relaxed position. We need to, she needs to be reminded to offer both breasts at each feeding. Starting with the 4 o'clock feeding on the right side, the subsequent feeding, whatever time the baby would need it, would then be started on the left side, always offering both breasts with each feeding. Once you start to uh, initiate the breastfeeding on the first breast, say the right one, the baby would nurse there for five minutes and then need to be moved. The baby sucks more vigorously during the first five minutes and will empty the first breast quicker. In order to prevent any type of breast infections, it's important to make sure that both breasts have been drained during feeding. Breaking the suction by inserting the, the finger into the corner of the baby's mouth will prevent her from getting any irritation to the nipple as well. Now what if you have a mom who becomes engorged or a mother has chosen not to breastfeed? What types of things would we see here? What would be care for engorgement? The first thing we would want to do if they're a nursing mom is to make sure that they're nursing frequently, every 30 minutes to 3 hours. Remember, babies are fed now on demand. We do not say the child's going to be fed every 2 or 3 or 4 hours. The baby is fed when needed. You need to make sure that you completely empty the breast if breastfeeding. A warm shower or compress can help with the letdown reflex and help decrease engorgement if it's occurring. And remembering to alternate the start of breastfeeding with each breast also will help. Mild analgesics can be used if needed, as well as ice packs. Now in the case of the mother who has decided not to breastfeed, it would be very important to make sure that she does not do anything to stimulate the letdown reflex. She should not be standing in a warm shower in response to engorgement, but in fact should try and withstand it by using some type of pain medication and a tight-fitting bra. Over the course of 24 to 48 hours, the engorgement will decrease as well as the discomfort. Now let's look at another exercise that a mom can do to try and prevent problems in the post-op period. This would be the Kegel. And we alluded earlier that the Kegel is tightening of the muscles on the pelvic floor. The muscles become tight and they're held for about three seconds. They are then relaxed. This need to, needs to be practiced about ten times, three times a day. As we talked about earlier, it's important to do this to enhance healing and to promote the return of vaginal tone. It also, in later years, prevents or decreases stress incontinence. Parenting is another issue that we would want to look at in this postpartum period. We want to make sure that we promote realistic, age-appropriate expectations for the mom to accomplish. Educate them as to what to expect as so that they do not expect to be able to do everything all at once. We want to observe what they're doing to try and provide some anticipatory guidance of problems that might arise. Encourage them to ask questions. Educate them regarding the routine hospital care and immediate needs of the baby at home. Also, we're going to want to observe their response to stress, such as a baby that becomes cranky. We want to support them and also teach them about contraception. Remember, breastfeeding does not prevent ovulation and a mom can become pregnant during breastfeeding. 
Contraception needs to be used to prevent future pregnancies prior to the first menstrual period. Let's move forward out of this postpartum period and look at childbearing maternal complications. The first one we're going to look at is spontaneous abortion. During the assessment of this problem, we would find persistent uterine bleeding with cramp-like pain. There would be negative or weakly positive pregnancy test. One of the implementations or actions that we would be taking is to monitor the vital signs, to check for vaginal bleeding, and to evaluate the pain. Again, the mother has been pregnant, and if the RH negative, would need to be administered Rogam. You need to save all tissue that is expelled, as well as providing the mom with emotional support. If this was a wanted pregnancy, the mother is going to be upset. If this was a pregnancy with question, they may or may not need that same level of emotional support. As we progress into the next type of abortion, here we're looking at spontaneous or threatened abortions. With the assessment, we're going to see vaginal bleeding and cramping, a soft uterus, but a cervix that is closed. The nursing interventions in this threatened abortion would be to decrease activity, help the mom to avoid any additional stress, and monitor for bleeding. Now what happens if the abortion is inevitable? What would the assessment piece look like in this case? As we look at this, we see that with assessment of an, a spontaneous abortion that is inevitable, we're going to find persistent symptoms, cramping, etc. There will be cervical dilatation and effacement. The cervix will begin to open. In this case, we need to save and count all of the peri pads to determine how much bleeding is taking place and prepare the mom for a DNC. In this case, the mom has probably lost the baby and she will need to be scraped to make sure there's no retained placenta or fetal parts. You need to support the mom emotionally through this loss as well as the father and any other family members that might be present. Now, what other types of problems can we run into as far as abortion? One of them would be the incomplete abortion. And this is where the mom has persistent symptoms, has expulsion of the part or products of conception, but not all of it. Part of was a key word here. In this case, we're going to administer her with blood or IV fluids as well as oxytocin. Remember that oxytocin is a hormone agent that causes contractility of the uterus. A DNC or suction evacuation would be used to remove any retained parts. Now the last section that we're going to look at refers to complete and missed abortions. Let's begin here with a complete abortion. The complete abortion appears with persistent symptoms, but all of the products of conception have been expelled. Here we again possibly would use oxytocin because we need to have that hormone agent present in order to cause contractility of the uterus and slow down the bleeding. Again, we need to support the family with their loss during this postpartum period. Now let's move forward and look at the last area um, as far as a missed abortion. In this case, with assessment, we would find a cervix that is closed. If the baby or fetus is retained greater than six weeks, there is an increased risk of infection and DIC. So what do we do here? We're going to implement again with doing a DNC evacuation. We will remove the contents from the uterus. Now what happens with a mom that has a problem with habitual spontaneous abortion? What types of things do we see in this population? With this type of individual, you see a problem with an incomplete cervix or infertility. Habitual spontaneous abortion occurs when the cervix cannot hold the fetus during development. So our intervention is to go in and suture, close the cervix to prevent its premature dilatation. This is called slerclege. Let's move forward and look at some of the childbearing maternal complications that you need to know on the NCLEX. The first item is we need to be able to identify the symptoms and care for an individual with an eptopic pregnancy, a pregnancy that is developing in the tubes. We also need to be able to identify and care for a mom experiencing pregnancy-induced hypertension. Also, you will need to be able to identify the differences in symptoms and care for placenta previa and abruptio placenta. Let's begin first by looking at the individual who presents in the emergency room with an ectopic pregnancy. With ectopic pregnancy, you see a mom who has unilateral lower quadrant pain. Her abdomen is rigid and tender. She is bleeding into the abdominal cavity. She will have a low hemoglobin and HCG level, or pregnancy hormone. There will also be bleeding um, from the vaginal area. 
Implementations that we would use during an ectopic pregnancy would be to look for shock. We're going to administer Rogam and provide support. Now when you consider this topic, where do you think the NCLEX question would come from? If you're thinking hydration and shock, you're probably correct. Remember, NCLEX is looking for safe interventions, although it's important to decrease the mom's pain and also to provide her with emotional support. If we did those without hydrating, we would put the mom at risk of death. We hydrate with ectopic pregnancies. Let's move on to the next complication, pregnancy-induced hypertension. This is experienced frequently by moms that have a large fetus that's developing. They are older than 35 years or younger than 18. They are either a first-time or second-time mom with multiple fetuses and sometimes are individuals who have been nutritionally deprived or on, are receiving poor nutrition. Frequently, the mom has a history of diabetes, renal or vascular disease, or a family history of pregnancy-induced hypertension. Pregnancy-induced hypertension can lead to eclampsia, and what we're going to do now is look at the different forms or severity of preeclampsia and what we will see and what we need to do to intervene. Let's begin with mild preeclampsia. Mild preeclampsia presents with a blood pressure of 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, or increases of 30 over 15 millimeters of mercury. In that in a mom who was normally 120 over 80, we would see her presenting with a blood pressure approximately 150 over 95. We also are going to see one or two plus proteinuria. This is not on a one-time occurrence, but a continual problem with proteinuria. It usually begins past the 20th, 20th week of gestation, and there is usually some slight generalized edema. How do we take care of this? In this situation, the mom is usually still at home, so our treatment intervention should proceed with a home intervention. They are put on bed rest in the left lateral position with a well-balanced diet and encouraged to weigh themselves daily. We are looking for no further increases in weight, identifying as swelling, weight increase, which would be connected with a retention of fluid and a possible further increase in blood pressure. Diversional activities needs to be encouraged. No mom that's fairly healthy wants to be restricted to bed. What are we going to see with the mom that's presenting with severe preeclampsia? In this case, we're going to see a blood pressure that's increasing 150 to 160 over 100 to 110 millimeters of mercury with an increase in proteinuria to 4 plus. They will be experiencing some headache and possibly blurred vision as well as some epigastric pain. Epigastric pain can be a preliminary symptom or an early sign that a seizure may occur. We know in the preeclampsic patient that is, has severe symptoms, if we do not reverse these symptoms quickly, they can develop um, convulsions and coma. Let's look at what the nurse can do at this stage. In this case, what we would want the mom to do is get into the hospital immediately. We're going to place her on bed rest and monitor her vital signs as well as the baby's fetal heart tones or heart rate. Remember, fetal heart tones and heart rate are an excellent indication of the baby's oxygenation level. We're going to look at her intake and output, and we are going to provide her with seizure precautions, patting the railing and keeping her in a quiet environment. Medications that can be used for preeclampsia are magnesium sulfate, apresoline, valium, and procardia. Let's talk about these for a minute. When we talk about magnesium sulfate, we are talking about trying to prevent seizure activity. We know that as our magnesium level rises, we get depression of our deep tendon reflexes. We want to depress this mom, but not severely. So we are going to start her on a magnesium drip. As a magnesium drip is infusing, it's going to be very important to have that baseline assessment of her reflexes and continue to evaluate how they are responding. If they become too depressed or she begins to de develop respiratory depression, we need to turn off that magnesium sulfate. Let's look at the next drug, Valium. Valium is used at this point to try and sedate the mom. Caution needs to be used in that it can cross a placental barrier and can cause neonatal depression. A presaline is an antihypertensive agent that would be used to try and vasodilate and thus decrease the mom's blood pressure. Procardio, we know as a cardiac calcium channel blocker, will also cause vasodilatation. 
with a side effect sometimes of having some smooth muscle relaxation. Let's look a little further at what the individual will look like if these interventions are not effective. What does the patient look like that has developed eclampsia? Eclampsia appears with severe hypertension, proteinuria, convulsions, and coma. Implementations during this period of time become a medical emergency. The baby is going to need to be delivered quickly or the seizure activity stopped. Again, this is a medical emergency requiring large bore IV needles for hydration, minimizing any outside stimuli, making sure the airway remains open and providing the mom with additional oxygen, thus ensuring the baby not developing hypoxia. We are going to administer the medications we've talked about previously and prepare the mom for delivery. If the mom was to develop seizure activity, we would then institute those measures that we know we use for seizure patients as far as protecting them from injury and not restricting their activity. You are going to monitor the mom for 48 hours after the delivery of the baby continuously for the, the sustained chance of seizure activity. DIC may also develop and if so would be treated with anticoagulants. Let's look at another maternal complication, placenta previa. And remember, you need to know the differences between placenta previa and abruptio placenta. Placenta previa presents with, during the first and second trimester, with slight spotting. During the third trimester, they will present with painless, profuse bleeding. Now, what in exactly is placenta previa? Placenta previa is where the placenta is growing on the lower side of the uterus. And as the mom progresses in labor, instead of the uterus rising up, or the placenta rising up along the uterine wall, it remains in a low segment position. As the cervix begins to dilate, the placenta starts to tear away from the uterine wall, thus bleeding, but no pain. With implications associated with placenta previa, we want to make sure that the mom is on bed rest in the sideline position or Trendelenburg. We do not want the baby pressing against this detaching placenta. Ultrasound would be used to locate exactly where it is and how extensive the separation is occurring. There will be no vaginal or rectal exams and amniocentesis might be employed in order to determine the lung maturity of the baby. Remember here we would be looking for the LS ratio. Daily hemoglobin and hematocrits would be used to evaluate the extent of bleeding and the development of anemia. And we will monitor the bleeding by counting pads. Now the mom may, able to be, may be able to remain at home with the onset of placenta previa as long as the bleeding is not large. What kinds of things could we encourage them to do at home? First, they need to limit their activity. Activity causes the uterus to contract somewhat and shifts the positioning of the baby. We need them on rest. There will be no douching, enemas, or coitus. We want to monitor the fetal movements as well as possibly perform a non-stress test every one to two weeks to see how the baby is hand or the uterus is going to handle the contractions. Now let's look at assessment for abruptio placenta. Abruptio placenta differs from the placenta previa in that this placenta is positioned correctly in the uterus but is separating prematurely. Let's begin by looking at the fact that in this case, the patient is going to present with painful vaginal bleeding. But this bleeding usually does not equal the changes that we are going to see in their hemoglobin and hematocrit because frequently the blood is trapped behind the separating placenta. The abdomen becomes tender, painful, and tense, and the baby may develop some fetal distress in that we would see an increase in heart rate. Contractions may start because the uterus is prematurely separating. Remember, this is dark blood on the exit that we would see. It has taken time to get past the separating placenta and out the cervical opening. Abruptio placenta can be an emergency situation. If it separates too much, the baby is being deprived of oxygenated blood and nutrients. So let's look at what we would do in this case. Implementations that are used are to monitor the mom and the baby for any distress. We are going to prepare the mom for immediate delivery and, in the post-op period, observe for any complications. We know that the complications in the postpartum period remain fairly similar. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, treated with anticoagulants, pulmonary emboli, which is treated also by placing a mom at risk on anticoagulants, infection, and possible renal failure. 
Renal failure would result if the mom developed shock in response to being hypovolemic. Let's go on and look at some of the other problems a mom can develop that can complicate a pregnancy. Here we're going to begin by looking at diabetes. If the mom is diabetic, she has some increased risk during her pregnancy, one of them being the increased risk of maternal infections. Also, she may have problems with excess amniotic fluid or hydramnios. Microsomoa is a, large, a baby large for gestational age. Congenital anomalies may also occur as well as premature labor and delivery. Respiratory distress syndrome may develop in the baby in the postpartum period, as well as the mom or baby may experience problems such as ketoacidosis, fluctuations in blood sugar, as well as pH. Now, how does a mom appear that has gestational diabetes? What will we see as this develops during pregnancy? Remember, gestational diabetes is diabetes that develops during pregnancy. Let's look at some of the signs. The first one is that the mom will appear to have hyperglycemia after 20 weeks of gestation. This would be identified through either the use of a glucose tolerance test or glycosate hemoglobin, which looks at three months trends in blood sugar. Gestational diabetes can be controlled by diet and, if not, will not be treated with hypoglycemic agents, but instead insulin. Oral hypoglycemic medications are contraindicated in pregnancy. They increase the risk of defer deformity and birth defects. Again, insulin would be used, and if started, would increase during the pregnancy because the demand for insulin increases in the second and third trimester. Tests for diabetes are done usually between 24 and 28 weeks gestation on all pregnant moms. Let's go on to look at who is at risk of developing gestational diabetes. One of the factors that we see is obesity. The other one might be family history of diabetes itself. History of gestational diabetes during a previous pregnancy would also set the mom up for risk. Hypertension, pregnancy-induced hypertension, urinary tract infections, manilia vaginitis, and polyhydramnios is also risk factors or signs of possible development of gestational diabetes. If they have delivered a previous birth of a large baby greater than nine pounds, we should also be watching this mom for the development of GDM. Unexplained stillborns or anomalies would also be a risk, as well as increased sugar in the urine and proteinuria. What do we do for the mom that is presenting in the, in the well care center or you know, the prenatal clinic with gestational diabetes? One of the things that we're obviously going to do is begin to monitor her blood sugar. The mom and the baby need to be followed throughout this pregnancy closely. She needs to be taught to eat prescribed amounts of food at the same time throughout the day. She is going to begin some home glucose monitoring and also taught about the ways that she will change her insulin requirements as the placenta makes changes on the insulin availability. Now the next disease process that we're going to look at that can complicate pregnancy is cardiac disease. Let's begin by looking at the assessment piece. When we assess a mom with cardiac disease during pregnancy, we are looking for signs of chest pain or shortness of breath. Tachycardia or signs of failure need to be picked up immediately because not only is the mom but also the baby at risk. Remember, cardiac disease is complicated during pregnancy because our circulating volume is increased. Implementations that would be used include encouraging the mom to have periods of rest, doing moderate, not ex extreme activity, and avoiding individuals that may have an upper respiratory infection. Another problem that can occur that can complicate the pregnancy and birthing process is STDs, or sexually transmitted diseases, in particular syphilis. Let's look at what happens with syphilis and pregnancy. What do we see and how do we treat it? The first thing we're going to see is a mom presenting with a positive VDRL. There may be lesions or cankers forming on the vaginal opening, and there will be a previous history of spontaneous abortion, premature birth, or possible full-term stillborns. What we do in this case is to start the mom immediately on identifying this problem on penicillin. Penicillin crosses the placenta wall and allows the baby as well as the mom to be treated for the syphilis. The other STD that we're going to be concerned with is gonorrhea. We know that this can be treated during the pregnancy as well as with the interventions we do immediately after birth. 
the mom with gonorrhea and pregnancy is going to present with positive cultures from vaginal secretions and a purulent drainage. Actions that the nurse will take in this situation is to administer antibiotics. Again, these antibiotics can cross the placenta wall and treat the baby while in utero, as well as instill prophylactic medications in, into the infant's eye at birth. Primary choices now are erythromycin and genomycin drops.